Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Friday. My name is DJ at large. Mm, mm, mm. In fact, let me stop sharing so you guys can see my beautiful face, my big smile, because it is a Friday. <laughs> I've actually missed you guys so much. Uh, it's been a long week. Uh, despite that, you guys have taken the time to join us. So thank you so much. Uh, in the, the chat box, let me know where you currently watching from so where are you right and of course you know what the hashtag is the hashtag as per normal is the secure the bag where are you currently watching from that's what i'd like to know from you guys as you know my name is dj at large it's all about the l plus earn consumer financial education program and today it is webinar number three if you've only joined us now where have you been why did you miss the first two i won't judge you I won't be upset. It's all right. So as I said, my name is DJ at large. And over the next couple of weeks, Asisa Foundation will be helping you to build a relationship with your money through the L plus earn consumer financial education program. Our hashtag across social media is, uh, of course, hashtag secure the bag. So let me know where you are currently watching from. As per normal, out in Joburg in Parktown, it's sunny, but it's very, very cold. Despite that, I'm still showing a little bit of some skin, right? I'm still showing a little bit of some skin. So let me guys know exactly where you guys are watching from. Uh, I will be going through some of your chats. Uh, Bongani says I'm out um, in Pretoria. Malaika says I'm out in Cape Town. I'm seeing uh, somebody else saying I'm out in Shopville enjoying the webinar already. Thank you guys so much. Absolutely missed you guys and I'm super excited to have you guys. As per normal, remember to visit the L plus Earn website, which is www za for access to some great financial resources, such as the recording of this webinar, which will be available next week, Wednesday. And if you have any issues or concerns, please send an email to Sarah at groundedmedia.co.za. We'll share her details in the chat. Uh, talking about last week and our last webinar, I'd like to announce our nine winners from last week, right? So, uh, you know, if you interact with us, you do the polls, you have this opportunity to win. So last week's winners, uh, top three winners for chats and comments. Uh, these ones go to Edilei Akinshoto, Asivena Lujajala, and Lesejo Dinake. Congratulations to them. Uh, our other top three winners for top session engagement is Mukwena Musheli, Ngedom Tetwa, and Kosinato Shongwe. And uh, our top three winners for pre and post surveys is Raiside Rankapole, Bulelo Indika, and Spiso Subusiso. So if you would like to win this week, engage in the chat box, ask questions, comment, participate in the polls. Uh, I love to chat, right? I love to chat. So get into the chat box and uh, let me know uh, how you're feeling today. Where are you currently watching from? So in terms of our webinars, if you missed us last week, uh, you couldn't join for whatever reason. Don't stress, don't worry. The recording is available on the L Plus Earn website. Uh, we still have four interactive webinars to go. Uh, so please put these dates in your diary and set a Friday reminder. We'll be covering investing part two, which is today. We've got entrepreneurship, managing credit, work readiness. And over the remaining four weeks, we'll be helping you to build a relationship with your money. Right, so going to have some fun over the next uh, four weeks. And of course, we're also going to be joined by some amazing people as well. We've got two special guests uh, who will be coming on later on. Uh, let me give them a quick virtual high five. I see Michael's cameras already on. Big, beautiful smiles, gents. I hope you guys are well. Are you guys good? Yeah, good this side. Lovely, lovely. I'd love for you guys to give me a nice virtual high five uh, so we know that you're alive in there. So three, two, one. <laughs> right, cool. So Michael and Gavin will be joining us a little bit later on. So before we get started and start talking about investing, as per norm, I have a random money question for the audience, right? If you were creating your own cryptocurrency coin, what would you name it? Right? Use the hashtag secure the bag. Go down to the chat box right at the bottom where it says chat. Click it. Let me know if you were creating your own cryptocurrency coin, what would you name it, right? Because I've noticed like crypto coins have sexy names. 
Uh, but Bitcoin, Bitcoin is on six. Mm -mm, mm -mm, but, but Terra, ooh, that sounds nice, right? So but the, the new coins seem to be meme coins. They seem to be fun, colorful. They've got all these nice names. So if you were creating your own, what would you name it? If I was creating one, I'd call it the extra large coin. Sounds nice. The extra large coin. I know it's something that you guys would invest in. <laughs> Let me see what's going on in the chat box. Uh, lots and lots and lots of messages. Let's see, CP, uh, CP was says, Spessy says, what I'd call my coin. Love that. Uh, I see somebody else saying the magic coin. Um, Lazan says the rich coin, right? So that's for the ballers, the billionaires and millionaires. All right, cool stuff. Tato says, I would call mine the Vic coin, right? So, the, so from Victoria, so the Vic coin. Loving that one. Keep sending us uh, all those comments. If you were creating your own cryptocurrency coin, what would you call it? That's what I'd like to know from you guys. So let's have a look at today's menu. These are some of the things that we will be covering, right? We've got cryptocurrencies, online trading, investment fundamentals, and then the role of a financial advisor or planner, right? So that's what's on today's menu. So let's get started with cryptocurrency. It's one that tends to dribble a lot of people. So later on, Michael will demystify a lot of this stuff, right? But simply put, cryptocurrency is money for the internet. So everything that you can do with a rand, a euro, or dollar, you can basically do with cryptocurrency. So you could buy goods and services, you could send or receive it, you could lend it out, you could even hold it as an investment, right? One of the big things about crypto is that it's digital, right? So it's created and stored digitally. It's also decentralized and it's not regulated. This means that crypto is managed by computers with no need for a bank or a central authority, right? So as an example, I could simply send you crypto without the need for a middleman. But if you send me an e-wallet, there are costs, right? There are limits in terms of how much you can send to me. And of course, there needs to be a bank. It can't just happen, you know, without a bank. So, you know, those are some of the differences between just traditional money, the rands, the euro, the dollars, and of course, cryptocurrency, right? So cryptocurrency doesn't have these limitations that I mentioned earlier on. But because crypto is digital, right, there is a risk of these computers crashing or being hacked. Uh, which could be bad news for your Ethereum, your Bitcoins, and so forth. Uh, crypto is also quite uh, volatile, right? So the price of crypto goes up and down. Michael might even tell us exactly why this actually happens. One minute, it's good. You feel like your pages in Mutsepe. The next minute, things are looking horrible. Why is crypto so volatile? He'll touch on that. Another thing to note is that a lot of scammers like to use crypto as the face of their scams because they know that people don't fully understand cryptocurrencies and of course we'll also touch on scams as well and as mentioned later on michael will tell us more about crypto and answer all of your burning crypto questions now onto online trading the likes of forex Ooh, forex see so what is this whole trading thing all about right so trading is about buying and selling frequently to make a profit so this could be shares it could be currencies like the dollar or the euro. It could be commodities like gold or platinum or any other types of instruments, right? So the idea is you buy at lower prices so that you can sell at higher prices and make a profit. However, trading requires a level of skill, of experience, because it's quite risky, right? You could lose all of your money. And trading can be done through a stockbroker or directly on an online platform. And I know that Gavin will touch on trading specifically. But if you've got a burning question already, there is the Q&A tab right at the bottom that you can click and uh, start submitting some of your questions in relation to trading if you do have any. And now onto the role of a financial advisor, right? So what are financial advisors? I like to see them as doctors for our money, right? So they are trained professionals that share their knowledge, their expertise about financial products and solutions that best fit you and your circumstances. So they will help you with holistic 
financial planning so that you can better understand the various financial products that are out there, identify the most tax and cost efficient way to invest, help you to avoid scams, uh, whilst also providing you with some sound financial advice. And of course, you may contact a financial uh, planner um, at, uh, you know, if you want to ensure that the person you're talking to is actually registered and authorized, then you can contact the Financial Planning Institute for Certified Financial Planners or the FSCA, just to check that the person you're talking to, are they who they say they are? Are they qualified to be giving you financial advice? Uh, other things that uh, you need to take into consideration when we talk about the role of a financial advisor, right, is that as I mentioned before, uh, you have financial advisors that could be independent, and you also have financial advisors that are linked to product supplier companies, right? So these uh, individuals uh, could be working for Old Mutual or Sunlam or Momentum, and if so, they may possibly only advise on products linked to that particular company, while the independent advisors can offer you products and solutions from a range of multiple product uh, suppliers. So one of the questions that normally comes up when we're talking about financial advisors, financial planners is, so how do they actually make money out of this entire thing, right? So where are they making money? Well, they can earn a commission, uh, they can also charge a consultation fee, or it could be a combination of the two. Uh, and what I think is really, really important for our audience, for our young people, right? If you are looking to choose a financial advisor, financial planner, it needs to be somebody that is registered, that is adequately qualified and experienced, you know, but also somebody who understands you as a person, who understands your financial circumstances and goals, right? So financial planners who are adequately qualified uh, belong to an FPI and can use the accreditation title Certified Financial Planner. So if you see CFP, then you know they're the real deal, right? And they belong to the FPI. In terms of uh, expert presentations, I did mention earlier on that we do have uh, Michael uh, Jordan. He had a big, beautiful smile. We did that whole uh, high five and all of that. Uh, Michael, before I bring you in, I want you to start thinking about your crypto coin, right? So uh, Michael is an amazing gent. Uh, he is an actuary with a passion for future of finance, right? He works for Polygon Technology and is a fellow of the Actuarial Society of South Africa. Michael, it's great to have you in terms of our webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, in terms of creating your own cryptocurrency, what would you call it? No, it's, uh, it's quite interesting because back in 2017, I actually created my own token um, oh. called Hypecoin. And it was an interesting one because I didn't make it on the blockchain. I thought to myself, oh, you know, do we really need the blockchain in order to create our own currency? So I made it on Google's Firebase, which is a centralized database, um, did the programming, made an app, all these things. And the idea behind it was that I took the Facebook like and thought, let's turn that into a currency. So you could have a limited number of likes, but you could send your likes to your favorite celebrity multiple times. So instead of just liking Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift, Selena Gomez once each, you could send 100 to Justin Bieber, five to Taylor, and three to Selena, basically creating a portfolio of your, of your fandom. And then your friends could see, oh, look, I'm also obsessed with this guy and, and that kind of thing. But like I said, I programmed it without the blockchain and two errors popped up. Uh, the one was that if you sent a negative amount to your friend, because that was also the thing with the app is that you could send tokens to each other. If you sent a negative amount to your friend, it actually took the tokens away from their wallet and put it into yours. Uh, so there was some bad programming on, on my half. And then because I made it on a centralized database and I'm a bit of a rookie programmer, I didn't hide all the security keys. So people were able to hack into the database and then change all the amounts and give themselves like 900 million and, and all these kind of things. So it was quite a fun exercise because I learned that, hey, you actually want this blockchain because of course what the blockchain brings is security. Um, and it takes away that centralized power because with this token that I had created, I had kind of made myself a little bit like the central bank. I could create as many of these tokens as I wanted. And of course, the danger was that when somebody hacked into it, they then got that power. And with, with crypto, with blockchain, um, you know, that's not possible. So it was a good lesson for me to find out firsthand um, why 
blockchain is necessary for creating these tokens rather than the the centralized service which is kind of a little bit like the old school or, or current technology that we that we have yeah so thank you so much for telling us a bit about this hype coin and all the lessons that came with it and of course there you know a number of participants that are interested in cryptocurrency uh, and sometimes it dribbles you like it's difficult to understand there's all this big uh, terminology and all of that and of course you'll be taking us through a number of slides um, so that you can uh, you know better explain what cryptocurrency is in a very simple way so we're going to go on to the first slide and of course michael i'll let you take it away and of course uh, you know, give us the, 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 the schooling in terms of cryptocurrency. No, perfect. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there is this psychological term called sudden wealth syndrome. And it's when you get sick from getting rich too quickly. You kind of feel dizzy. You feel unstable. It's kind of like you're on top of a mountain struggling for, for air. And it's quite weird because we kind of think getting rich very quickly is a good thing. But psychologically, it can have these like negative impacts on you. And what's interesting is that there's three main causes of sudden wealth syndrome. That can be inheritance, like a rich uncle of yours passes away, um, winning the lotto, or the third most common thing is cryptocurrencies. And that is because cryptocurrencies have made a lot of people very, very rich, but it's important to also realize that it's made a lot of people very, very poor. Because if we were to go into the next slide, um, I'm not sure how many... Uh, people here recognize this YouTuber uh, known as KSI. He lost 42 million Rand just in the month of May this year. 42 million Rand. So that means if you're earning a salary of 30,000 Rand, it would take you 115 years to make that money. And this was all just poof, gone. And this wasn't because it was due to a scam. This was simply by trading. And it's this thing called trying to catch a falling knife. And the crazy thing is I did, I did the same thing, although I was on a bit of a smaller scale, didn't lose 42 million, fortunately, but did lose a, a significant chunk. And what we were both doing is we were trading this token called Luna. And Luna was trading at around $90 at the beginning of the year. It then drops down to $3. So both KS and I think, well, it's going to bounce back. You know, you buy the dip, at the price is going to shoot shoot all the way up. It's going to get saved. The problem is it didn't. And the price of this Luna token is now 0 0.000001. So it's a bit of a bit of a scary thing. Um, like I say, fortunately, I didn't lose 42 million. Um, but you do have people who lose massive amounts of, of money. And if we were to go into like the next slide, we can then ask ourselves, well, you know, does that mean crypto is is like the casino? Like, is this is this whole thing just gambling? And I would say no, because at the casino you're expected to lose. You know, for every rand you put in at the at the casino, you're only expected to get ninety cents back. And of course, this makes sense. This is why the casinos are so beautiful, and they can hire all these people, and they have these giant giant buildings. With crypto, the odds are unknown. It could be the best bet of your life or it could be the worst. But what you mustn't do is you mustn't fool yourself into thinking that you know what's going to happen. As soon as you think, oh, I'm going to buy Bitcoin because I know tomorrow it's going to go up. Okay, that's very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous because anything can happen and it frequently does. I always kind of say on any given day, you can double your money or you can halve it. You know, there is this huge, huge amount of volatility. And if we go into the next slide, a lot of people I see talk about, you know, oh, these mathematical charts. And when we studied specifically actuarial science and we go into, you know, we study time series and the mathematics behind these things. And to us, they are meaningless. And the reason why we say that these things are meaningless is because it's very easy to construct an opposing chart to tell a very different narrative. So you have all of these YouTubers saying, oh, this is what's going to happen, you know, because this line is intersecting that. And sometimes that it happens purely by chance. Um, sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because they say, oh, it's going to go up and all their viewers watch it and they buy and they kind of fulfill the prophecy. But mathematically, when you kind of go back, you can construct completely different charts and show an opposing story. And like I say, from a statistical point of view, there's too much randomness and noise for any pattern to be sustained over a significant time period. 
So then you might say, well, okay, forget about the maths. What about reading the news? You know, like you'll read China has banned this and then Europe eases up on that. And you're reading all these news and it's very difficult then to quantify, you know, how much of an impact is this going to have on the price? But it's also important to realize that by the time that you have read the news, the price most likely will already be reflecting it. Because remember, Bitcoin is trading 24-7. So if you wake up in the morning and you read that China has banned this, well, everybody in the time zone ahead of us has already seen that news and already acted on it. So unless you get the news, unless you work at the newspaper and you get it before it's printed, it's very, very unlikely that you can profit by reading the news. And I have a lot of friends who spend all their time doing these charts, reading the news, you know, thinking that they're doing this research, but at the end of the day, that's just not, it, it doesn't give them any, any benefit, any, any yields. And the reason why I want people to be aware of this is because you must realize that there is no crypto expert. And I think this is where, you know, we're going to come onto the, the, the scam slide now. Um, if you realize that there is no expert in reading charts, in reading news, you'll realize that whenever somebody says, oh, I'm an expert in crypto, give me your money, um, you can be like, wait, 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 this, this asset class is still too volatile for there to be any meaningful um, you know, patterns that have emerged. So just remember that there are no crypto experts, and then that's going to help you avoid some of the most common scams. I mean, one of the, the common scams that we see is that your scammer will buy some, some random token, and then they'll tell everybody that it's amazing. So they'll create these Discord groups or these Facebook groups with hundreds and thousands of followers, and they'll say, hey, this coin is going to the moon, and this is going to rise. You're going to, this is amazing. So people buy into the token, but now remember, they they first buy it, then they pump it up, and then once everybody is buying in, buying in, that causes the price to go up, and they slowly start selling, slowly start selling. And this is known as a pump and dump. So they buy low, they push the price up by talking it up, everybody comes in and buys it, they sell it, then everybody realizes, wait, this is rubbish, what have we done? And the price then collapses. Look, some people make money on this rise. If you buy in early and you get out uh, before the crash, you can. But a lot of the times you buy in and then the crash happens and you can lose a significant amount of your money. There's this other one where scammers create their own token and they make grand promises. And people buy into the token believing that, hey, this is the next big thing. Um, and we saw this a lot happening in 2018, something known as ICOs, initial coin offerings, where people would sell a token before they built the actual uh, application. And the idea being that, oh, we're selling the token to raise money to build, you know, this amazing game or this amazing um, new ecosystem. And people, you know, give them money in good faith. And then these developers or these businessmen get all of this money and then they think to themselves, why should I do all the hard work once I've already been paid? And they sail off into the distance, nothing gets done, and this becomes known as a rug pool scam. Like I say, you don't want to buy into crypto if the app hasn't you know, been created yet. And then you have these other scammers, which I think are more prevalent here in, in South Africa, where you have people running around telling everyone that, hey, they've got a secret trading algorithm or an AI bot that is guaranteed to double your money, you know, and like, just give us $500 today and we'll double it to a thousand with, within a week. Now, not only do they take your money, uh, but they also convince you to introduce your friends to the scam. And this is kind of known as that whole Ponzi scheme. And the thing is, is that these scams are not new. We've seen them with the, the normal stock market. We've seen them, you know, with other assets. It's just that crypto makes it a lot easier to pull them off. And in fact, crypto makes a lot of things easier and removes many, many frictions. And that is why that this isn't actually, it's a good industry. This industry is worth over a trillion dollars and it's valuable because like I say, it has this use. It makes a lot of things easier. You want to send money from say South Africa to Zimbabwe. You want to go through the traditional banking system. It's like good luck trying to do that. Um, what we're seeing with crypto, you just do a few, you know, click a uh, send button and you can send money anywhere around the world 
without having to go through any form of government, uh, you know, capital regulations. So crypto makes a lot of things useful. And that's why everyone's getting excited about this technology. But because it makes things so useful and easy, it also makes it very easy for people to create scams. Now, we have the saying in, um, and, and that's why I guess, like, you know, you, you mentioned all of these scams and people might think, oh, I want to stay away from crypto completely. And it's like, Yes, in the short term, crypto is crazy, it could go up, it could go down, you could get scammed, you could, you know, all these horrible things can happen. But the future of finance is definitely going to involve some sort of decentralization, cryptographic blockchain element. So it is worth over a very long period to maybe consider adding this asset to your portfolio. But we have this saying in crypto where we say, if it's not your keys, it's not your tokens. So if you aren't in possession of the cryptographic password, then there's always a chance that you will lose your crypto. And that's why you need to become computer savvy first before you buy any crypto. It was, that's why in the early days, it was the nerds who bought into to crypto and the nerds who are kind of making a lot of money. And that's because you do need to be very comfortable with how computers work and how the internet works in order to just feel secure with this. What a lot of people do is they'll buy crypto and leave it on an exchange and then there's a chance that that exchange gets wiped out or goes out of business, and then you don't have any of your crypto. So it's very, very important that you learn and become a little bit computer savvy on how to do it. Fortunately, there are so many tutorials on, on the internet on, on how to do it. Um, for those of you who, who know that website called Medium, where you can write longer articles, I've written a whole article on how, I guess, a step-by-step -step process on, on how to actually get onboarded. Uh, but in, on the next slide, I'll just mention three things that are very, very important if you want to get started in this space. So for those of you who are based here in Cape Town, you will know the word LUNO uh, because it's now on one of the tallest buildings in, in the city. And that's a great sign to see that the banks are slowly getting replaced on the skyline. So LUNO is, is an exchange uh, where you can deposit money from your bank account and then exchange it and get, get something like Ethereum or Bitcoin. And then you'll see that there's this little orange fox over here. This is known as MetaMask. And this is, like I say, where you do want to become a little bit computer savvy. Um, here you download a Chrome extension. And what you'll do is you'll fill out a whole bunch of security seed phrases and get a cryptographic password, which you want to write down somewhere, keep it secure. So if your computer ever crashes, you can just take this piece of paper, go to another computer, and boom, you've got access to all of your, your crypto again. So MetaMask is kind of like your online wallet when it comes to these crypto things. And then a great website to kind of get started in all the weird and wonderful things that you can do in crypto. Because that's, that's the thing is that many people think, oh, you just buy crypto and you hold it. It's like, no, 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 there's, there's so much more that you can, you can do. You can leverage it. You can stake it. You can you know, invest it. You can bridge it. You can do all these crazy things. And that's why there's websites called Zapper.fi, which is this aggregator that will allow you to swap your Ethereum for maybe some other tokens, bridge to other blockchains, and will allow you to engage in DeFi, uh, which stands for decentralized finance, as well as these things known as DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations. But as you can see, like I'm throwing out a lot of jargon out there and it very much is a rabbit hole um, when once you get started, there's so much to discover and, and to learn. And that's why I'd, I'd encourage you all to embark on a crypto adventure. Um, I've got my, my YouTube channel called MJ the Fellow Actuary, uh, where I discuss things like NFTs. And there's this new technology out now called Zero Knowledge Proofs. Um, and more of these, you know, layer two blockchains. And you can see there's a lot of jargon and stuff to, to get up, you know, get out there. But I'd really recommend that you take a little bit of money um, and be very, very careful, play around with the crypto, learn about the ecosystem. And then once you're familiar with it, you can start investing more of a significant amount, you know, actually allocating a proper portion of your portfolio to it. But first play around with it uh, because it, it is an adventure and like all good adventures, there's always going to be a little bit of, of danger in the process. Um, but yeah, that is it for for the, the slides that I've got, of course, I'm going to be open to your yeah, questions and hearing your guys' opinions and looking forward to, to answering those.
absolutely amazing, Michael, in terms of just giving us just a simplified and, and interesting insights into what cryptocurrency is. And, you know, as I was going through, through some of the questions, you've already answered quite a lot of them. But if you do have a burning crypto question, go to the Q&A tab right at the bottom, click there and ask whatever question it is that you have around crypto. We will have a Q&A session. We will go through some of these. But in the meantime, you can go to the chat and maybe comment on your, your thoughts on what Michael has been saying. Uh, use the hashtag secure the bag. And I'll also ask Michael to dive into the chat and sort of just start to speak to people as well. But interesting insights in terms of cryptocurrency and where it is. Another gentleman that I'd also like to introduce and bring into the conversation is Gavin Smith. He has more than 12 years experience in the financial services sector. His vast experience and position as a financial planner means that he truly understands how to make your money work for you. Gavin is a certified financial planner and a member of the Financial Planning Institute of Southern Africa. And we'll be talking to Gavin about online trading about investing fundamentals, about the role of a financial planner slash advisor. Uh, Gavin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I loved your smile earlier on. I loved your energy. Thank you so much for joining us, Gavin. Thank you for having me, Chekhov. I'm glad to be part of this. It's always exciting to, as I would say, um, impart some knowledge to them. And hopefully the, the students can learn something from this. Um, Definitely did send me the questions that you would like to... Yeah, so, so, I, I, yeah so I do have a, a number of questions for you. And I want just to rewind back uh, in terms of online trading. Uh, how does this differ to investing? I think sometimes people tend to get it confusing. They confuse investing traditionally in like shares to online trading. What's the difference between these two? Okay, so if you look at investing as a principle, it's basically where you are either putting in a, a specific resource, hoping that it could lead to a, a better outcome for yourself. So in most cases, that resource is, is money. So I, I would say that you have to look at investing as sort of the big um, umbrella and online trading is one of those pillars of investing. It's one form that you can use to invest yourself. So that is basically how you can sort of connect the two. So the two is not opposites, um, of, of each other. It's basically just investing. They issue more traditional ways that people done it. And online trading, obviously, with the time that we are in, we online is a platform that we are use that we use daily. It only makes sense that it is a platform that you can also do use to do something as investing. No, that, that, that makes sense. And, and in terms of Forex trading, where does it fall into this? I mean, what is Forex trading? We see a lot of scams. We see a lot of people on, 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 on Twitter, as an example, or Instagram showing this beautiful lifestyle and it's all Forex trading. What on earth is that? So obviously, um, it's basically foreign trading is where you sort of do trading and you basically look at, so Forex basically means foreign exchange. So you probably try to sort of, for, to simplify, sort of bid on a specific currency, whether that currency is going to go up or down and hoping that your bet on it can lead to you making money. So the thing why, why it is, it's, it's again almost like Michael explained with, with, with cryptocurrency, it's, it's a lot of times people that don't really have any expertise on it. I think recently, they, a couple of months ago, there was a program, there was something on carte blanche about it. So it's all about just projecting that they know what they are doing. So in a game with, unlike we're also getting with cryptocurrency and trading in it, whenever you go into that field, it's important to, to verify the person that you are trading with credentials. For example, I as a financial planner, whenever I interact with the client, I'm by law required to send the client what we call a phase disclosure which indicate what I am licensed to give advice on, what in um, the organization I represent. And my, so it means that if I, for example, I'm not accredited to give advice on um, shares or anything like that. So I, if I said to the client, the client knows exactly what I can and can't do. So unfortunately with, um, with Forex, a lot of times you're only seeing what the person wants you to see. The person doesn't really show you if they know what they're doing. So it's mo mostly, just trying you to, to come in and sort of invest your money without really having any understanding of what they're doing. Mm, there's, there's quite a lot to consider when it comes to, to online trading. And I wanted to actually touch on that. I mean, what are some of the things to consider, um, you know, before one wishes to start getting into online trading? Okay. 
Look, I think the first thing that you always have to understand is that you, if, you, if you're going to go into online trading, it's an understanding that it is investing. There is a risk associated with it. So it's not something that is always going to make you money. You have to understand that there's a risk that you are taking, and that could be with regards to the thing that you are investing in, the thing that you are trading. But obviously with online trading, there is the other risk as well, where we look at things like scams and those. So it's important that you are aware of this, that this is something that can happen and understanding how to protect yourself against it. Um, and then also, I think a lot of times, and it's not just with online trading, it's with investing in general, it's understanding why are you investing in this in this asset class or why do you go with the cryptocurrency? Why is cryptocurrency the thing that you are investing in? Because a lot of times when we do make a decision of what we are investing in, it, it's not necessarily guided by why I'm investing. It's more guided by what I want to invest in. And sometimes when we just go with what I want to invest in, it is easy to overlook the risk associated with it because it's, um, I remember earlier this year, I had a very, it was a very long conversation with a client who was very pro cryptocurrency. I personally, I'm not anti cryptocurrency. However, the, the conversation was around the client's retirement fund. And currently in South Africa, because of Regulation 28, you can't have cryptocurrency exposure inside of a retirement fund. So the client was trying to get around that. And I was saying, okay, this is not something that I regulate, it's government regulation. Um, so, but you could see there was a very hard belief in cryptocurrency. So it's a very sentimental belief that this is the only investment that I should have, so I should be allowed to have it. So sometimes that is the, the, the we have to be careful about it because every investment comes with its own risk. And you should be okay with that before you invest in something to understand that I am actually taking a risk. And because of that, I should be, I should inform myself before I invest in it. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think it's the importance of investing in things that you understand and then linking it to your goals. What do you want to achieve? And what yes. are the products that could get you there? And perhaps an important place to go to, uh, Gavin, which is such an interesting one, is you know you're investing fundamentals right so you know what are some of these investing fundamentals that one always has to factor in when making an investment decision whether it's to buy crypto or to buy your exchange traded funds or unit trust i mean let's talk a bit about these investing fundamentals okay uh, again i will start with firstly whenever you select an investment understand why you're investing in that in it um, secondly, understand the legislation around investing. So South Africa, the most investments have, even with cryptocurrency, there is some form of legislation around it. So it's important that you understand this. So for example, take something like a tax-free savings account. It's a great investment. Um, it, your, your, your interest, your growth, your dividends is all tax-free. However, you can only invest 36,000 rand per year in it. In your lifetime, you can invest 500,000 rand in it. So when you, when you look at things like that, it's understanding those kind of principles. Secondly, uh, thirdly, one of the big things with any investment is understanding the tax consequences attached to the investment. Understand what kind of tax will I be liable for if I decide to invest in this? Um, also things like um, exposure, what, where can I, because every investment gives you exposure to certain things. It's either to specific asset classes, um, to things like specific regions, because we, because you are allowed to sit in South Africa, but you can invest your money globally with, through a South African investment vehicle. So always understand those kind of things and being aware of those kind of things. And I think one of the biggest things is cost. Because if you don't understand the cost associated with, a, with an investment, it's very difficult to gauge the success of the investment. Um, for example, I can say to a client, okay, your, your, your returns for this year was 6%, but if the, if the fees was 5%, did the client really benefit from the investment? So those are the kind of things that you need to be sort of aware of whenever you go into investing. Mm, that's very interesting. I want to touch a bit on your actual job. So being a financial planner, uh, what are three misconceptions that tend to come up when you're speaking to clients, uh, you know, when, when there are investment planners involved? So what are some of these misconceptions that come up? And maybe you can touch on three for us. Okay, I think one of the biggest ones is that clients believe that we sell policies. 
we don't sell policies. Um, we sometimes use a financial product to achieve a financial goal the client might have, and that is when we recommend a financial product. Um, secondly, financial planners is not just necessarily linked to financial products. In other words, when I meet with clients, I don't necessarily want them to take financial products. My role will also entail sitting and having conversations around um, estate planning, uh, making sure clients have wills in place. Uh, sometimes it goes beyond the personal financial planning of a client, but it goes into the client's business planning. So if the client is a business owner, want to start a business, touching on what would be the best business to start for the client. Are we going to go with a close corporation? Are we going with a, a partnership, a uh, a, a PTY limited and why those different things are important. Um, I think secondly, a lot of people also misunderstood that to become a financial planner, it's not just necessarily about being having sales experience. Yes, it's because of South Africa's the way our country is set up in our demographics, a lot of guys that gets into the financial planning industry, they get into it through sales because a, there's still a lot of financial a planning that is with the way we get remunerated and all those things that I mentioned early on commission and those things. So when this commission that is used to pay you, a lot of advisors then do have to sell. But for example, me to be able to use the designation of a CFP, I had to study for that. I had to, um, I had to do a post-grade diploma in financial planning. I had to write the board exam. So when you, when, you, when you look at it from that, a financial planner is to a certain extent a professional. So that is one of the big misconceptions. And I think one of the other things that we also find a lot is, is the expectation that financial advice is something that can happen around a bribe. Um, sometimes you have the bribe in a social gathering and people find out you're a financial planner and they really truly expect you to give advice just there. And that's not how it's supposed to be because financial planning is a, it's a very holistic view of it. So a lot of times that is the kind of misconception that people have when it comes to financial planners that we are able to, to diagnose your financial needs by having just one conversation with you without getting to really know you. And that is just sometimes it, 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 it can become not necessarily problematic, but you can, it can be a disadvantage to the client if you decide giving advice that way, because if you don't have the full picture, you might not be able to address all the client's needs. Mm, you know, and another thing that I've seen coming up um, when, when young people are talking about financial planners, financial advisors, is the assumption that once you see one, it solves all your money problems. So it's almost like, I've seen you, Kevin, it's done. But in actual fact, there's still work that I need to do. And I think that's, that's something that's quite important. Would I, would I be right in that? Yes. Um, so a lot of financial planners have a have different ways of working because that is normally how, it, um, depending on what plan, how the planner works. For example, my process is, I will meet with the client. I will always require that the client has one specific meeting with me. And within that first meeting, I will only spend time to get to know the client, ask a couple of questions. And then there would be a second meeting. In the second meeting, I would make a recommend. I will, I will sort of represent the client, present the client with what we call a financial plan. And on that plan, there will be recommendations. And the client then has the option of saying to me, okay, Gavin, I want to go ahead with the plan and then we will implement some of the stuff. But a lot of times you don't implement everything at the same time. Um, you sort of implement things as the client can implement it. So you sometimes it's because of financial restraint, sometimes because um, of certain events happening. Sometimes the client will say to you, look, I'm getting married in three months time. So I would want to address my medical aid needs once I'm married. So you wait for those three months. Now you come back and say to the client, okay, you are married now, let's address this. But then there's events that happens in client's life. And that is why it is never really done. Because as the event happened, the need might change. If a child is born, the need might change. If a client's life circumstances um, happens, the need might change. So that is why you can't expect one meeting with a financial planner to just solve all your problems in a lot of times. And I think this is what client, that is sometimes very frustrating for clients. A lot of times that meeting actually doesn't solve problems. It actually makes you realize there is bigger problems. And it, you, you walk out of the meeting not having addressed any of it because you start realizing that, I might have had my focus on just, to, just an experience I had recently. I met with a very young person who is who just started out their career, and he, he, he was very adamant he wanted to implement investment plans. And looking at his life and his career, the path that he's on, the one thing I immediately identified was he didn't have any risk cover. So I, was, I said to him, look, we can start an investment, yes, but if you don't have any risk cover, but even when we went back into it, 
I realized that he doesn't even work with the budget. So it was difficult to make safe for me to say to him, make financial commitments when there isn't a structured budget in place so where we can really see does is the is the is the money there to pay any premiums that might have to be paid because of the financial product that we're putting in place. And what we have now decided, it's all completely different from what he came in initially. We've, we, we're not saying to him, we, I'm ignoring those things. I'm just saying to him, let's find, initially, let's work around you having a budget. And once we have that in place, we can now go identify, where's the resources? Can we address these needs? And what need will be addressed first? So sometimes it happens like that, where you go into a meeting with one thing in mind, but when you walk out, just other things have sort of um, being exposed. And it's almost like going to the doctor sometimes. You go to the doctor believing you have the flu. And when you walk out of there, the doctor tells you, well, actually, it's not the flu. It's something different uh, that we have to address. So that is just sometimes what happens when you go and see a professional and you ask them to sort of look at your life and diagnose or come up with a solution for whatever might be wrong. No, that definitely makes sense. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing your insights in terms of, you know, the fundamentals and, and online trading and all of that. And of course, to our attendees that have uh, additional questions, there is the Q&A tab right at the bottom. And of course, if you have comments, click the chat tab at the bottom and hashtag secure the bag is the one that you should be, uh, you know, trying to uh, use in terms of all those comments. So I'm going to bring back uh, Michael and Gavin uh, back into the, the spotlight in terms of answering some of these questions. They are quite a number of them. So I'm going to try and get through as many as I possibly can. Uh, Gavin, uh, Michael, are you guys ready for some of these questions? Uh, this one uh, is actually directly for you, Michael. And the question is, is it possible to buy cryptocurrency outside of an exchange? Mm, I mean, this is how I got my, my original crypto. Um, so I was in Bitcoin back in 20. 2014, uh, when it was still like $600 a, a token, I think now it's like 23,000. And what I was doing is there were guys who were mining the Bitcoin. So that's how people got it. They connected their computer to the system, became part of a decentralized database. And then they would get all these tokens. And before there was an exchange, what I would do is I would buy them coffee and then they would send me a little bit of their, their Bitcoin. So there is a way to go onto the internet and find these miners directly and purchase it from them. This is known as peer-to-peer -peer trading. Of course, you want to do a lot of homework before you do this. And what I mean by that is you just want to make sure that the person has got a good reputation and that yeah, you're not, because uh, again, you don't want to be in that situation where you send them all your money and then they say, thank you. And then they, they disappear. Um, so there is a way to do it, but you want to make sure that the people have, have a good reputation. And I guess this is even a, a business opportunity for some people, let's say at university is because sometimes needing a bank account and needing to go through all of these hoops in order to get some crypto there's a business opportunity by buying a lot of crypto yourself, building up a good reputation amongst your friends, and then you know selling it to them directly with maybe a plus five percent fee or or whatever you deem necessary. So you buy all the Bitcoin or crypto off an exchange, and then you sell it directly to your friends for for cash. Of course, I must put this with a little bit of a disclaimer. You know, with the way regulations and and everything are, are growing in the space that might be illegal um, in, in the future, but it, it is something that you could potentially do where you can assist people in buying small amounts. We're in the situation where world governments are taking different views on crypto. You've got some nations like Germany that see it as a currency and therefore want to you know, put a whole bunch of currency rules onto it. You've got other countries like Switzerland that sees it as a financial asset and therefore, you know, all the asset laws come in. And then, you know, from a tax point of view, some of them will be see it as income tax, others will see it as capital gains tax. And so from a regulatory point of view, it's a it's a bit of a minefield, um, but it's something that the world is actively trying to to figure out. Mm, that makes sense. There's actually another question that touches on something that Michael's touched on, and it's around taxes. So I'll, I'll just throw this to Kevin first. Kevin, there's somebody that wants to know, um, when we're talking about online trading, cryptocurrencies, uh, is tax applicable? That's the first thing. And the second is, would your financial planner be able to help you with these tax related stuff? Or should you go and see a tax professional for that? 
Well, as the saying goes, there's two things in life that's certain, that is tax and debt. So yes, in South Africa, currently cryptocurrencies is taxed. Um, so they will be tax payable. Um, normally, if you are dealing with a very good financial plan, if someone that really respect what they're doing, um, there is 90% of times where your financial planner will work with a tax practitioner. Sometimes it's somebody that works in the office. It's like you sometimes go to a financial planner. You normally find that they have estate planners in there. They have tax practitioners. So normally in cases like this, yes, they will normally tell you that, okay, fine, for that particular thing, I'm going to recommend it. We speak to your tax practitioner. And that is normally also the sign of a good financial planner that, you know your own limitations. So if a financial planner tries to do everything themselves, because a lot of financial planners is also qualified um, accountants. So they sometimes they are able to do it themselves for you. But yes, um, that would normally be the case. Either recommend somebody to assist you with, or a lot of times, for example, in instance, the practice that I work for, we would normally just recommend somebody within the office because there is accountants and tech specialists that we're able to assist the client or something like this. Yeah. So we are running out of time, but there's two really important questions that have come in. So, and each of them are for, 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 for you, gents. Uh, Gavin, are, do you need to be rich to see a financial planner? When I'm coming there, must I have millions in the bank? <laughs> What's the situation? It's something that's been coming up. Okay. So normally the answer is, depends on which financial planners you go and see. They look, for a lot of financial planners try to have only like with a lot of businesses, only a trick, a certain type of clientele. So they would at times look at the client's assets and then determine on, is it something that I want to get involved in, but not necessarily no. It also comes down to what you want to do. Like one of the things I normally come across a lot is when I speak to young people or anybody who hasn't built wealth yet and I talk about the wills, a lot of them will say to me, but I don't have any money, so I don't need a will. I don't have anything. But my answer to them normally back is that Whenever, actually, when you have not, almost nothing, it's important to have a will because you don't want your family to fight over that little bit. I mean, if you take a guy like, um, say, if Bezos, if he dies tomorrow without a will, he's got enough money to leave money for the rest of the world. So in his case, nobody's going to fight about it, but I'm sure he's got a will. But even if you don't have money, you want to have a will. And even if you don't have money, it's always good to speak to a financial advisor because it might just be someone, like I said, assisting you with a budget or someone that to, get, to just give you advice around something simple. So yeah, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be rich to, to see a financial planner. Mm, I think it's such an important one. I think it, it also needs to be the fact that you want to get your finance together. You want to yeah. start learning and you want to get the assistance of a professional in this space. Uh, Michael, one other question that's also come up is, Asipi wants to know, to invest in cryptocurrency, must one be a programmer first? or have some programming skills? And it's an interesting question because I think it's about research and your level of knowledge before you start investing uh, in crypto. Uh, Michael, what do you say to, to Asipa's question? Um, yes, I would say you definitely want to understand how computers work. And I think this was something that I was very fortunate that you know I did information technology um, at school. And even though I didn't study computer science, I've always just kind of been a little bit of a nerd at heart and kind of kept my finger on, you know, technology and what's been happening. And even with this background, the space does confuse me. I mean, I, I work for, for Polygon, um, which is a scaling solution for Ethereum. And to be completely honest with you guys, I don't understand how the technology works. You know, we've got to a stage now where unless you've got a PhD in computer science, these new blockchains are completely next level, like really, really difficult from a mathematical point of view. So I would say that you do want to have a little bit of an understanding just so that you don't get completely lost. You don't get caught up in the hype. It's so easy for people to come in. Um, if you don't have any you know, exposure to computer science and say, oh, this new token, it's going to change the game because it's going to do X, Y, Z. If you know just a little bit of programming, like I say, you don't have to be an expert or anything, but if you know just a little bit, you can kind of discern whether this is, you know, too far-fetched or whether this is actually plausible. Um, also, you want to have a little bit of that, you also want to be able to differentiate between what we refer to as infrastructure tokens and the service tokens. So an infrastructure token is something like Ethereum, it's something like the Polygon Matic token, something like NIA. Um, there's quite a few of them, but then you've got the service level tokens, 
which are the applications that are built on top of these blockchains. Um, they're kind of like shares in the company. So I guess maybe as a, a nice analogy is think of Ethereum as the South African Rand. It's like the token of the, the ecosystem. Whereas the stock exchange, you know, you can buy shares in Old Mutual, Sunlam, and all of these things. Those are kind of your, your service level tokens. And we refer to them as dApps, decentralized applications. And you do want to have a bit of programming or computer knowledge to know whether these dApps are actually useful or not, because a lot of them are not. And that's why having that little bit of computer science, and like I said, you don't have to have studied it you know, for like five years or have a PhD in it, but you do want to read a few books on IT and understand the general system of how databases work before you just jump in. Because like I say, that's going to protect you from, from the scams. It's going to protect you from getting caught up in, in the hype. So yes, cryptocurrencies are very, very rewarding um, over the long term, but you do need to put in that research. You do need to put in that effort. And like I say, you want to be in a position where you can own your own crypto, you can hold your own private keys, and you do want to be a little bit of a nerd in order to, to do that properly. Um, and you know what I really got from, from, from you is just the importance of doing research, you know, investing in the things that you understand. And it's okay to say you don't know everything, you're willing to learn and you're willing to start, which I think is absolutely so important. I want so much more of Michael and Gavin. There's so many chats, uh, you know, messages in the chat, so many questions. So I'm going to ask uh, that Gavin and Michael dive into the chat and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, interact with some people, answer some questions there, because of course, Nah, go. And that's why I love the L plus Earn Consumer Financial Education Program. There's so much information, so much knowledge, and of course, experts that are sharing their expertise in terms of investing. So thank you guys so much for joining us in terms of Michael and Gavin and, you know, sharing their expertise. Keep asking all your questions and of course, get into the chat box. Hashtag secure the bag is uh, the hashtag to be using. So in terms of week two activities for this week, you know what you need to do. Zalto is the platform to get onto. So uh, in terms of focusing on week three activities and reflections, remember to register on Zlato uh, platform if you would like to win some goods and participate in our challenge. So we would love for you guys to put together a creative short video about what you've learned on this topic of investing. Then share it with us. It could be a song, a poem, a rap, a dialogue, a tick, Talk, but just keep it to a maximum of three minutes and you could stand your chance to win 280 Zlato. Uh, remember to register and to submit your video on the actual platform itself. And it is very, very simple in terms of that. Uh, there is a link that we will also share via email. We'll also share it in the chat box. Uh, create an account, upload your profile picture, um, completes the micro task. And of course, you could earn some Zlato. And of course, if you do win, this is where you can spend some of it. Always jealous when people are winning. Uh, you could buy some airtime, some electricity units. You could go to Peb, to Clicks. You could Uber. Uh, you could take me on a date to KFC, get me that streetwise too. So that's what you could do if you do win, but you need to register first right so in terms of your activities uh, for this week very very simple register on the zalto platform each week prizes will be awarded to nine students who actively participate in webinars and polls and of course we will be sharing that link and don't forget for resources and the webinar recordings visit the l plus earn website which is www.lplusearn.org.za thank you so much for joining us had an absolutely amazing time on the L plus earn consumer financial education webinar number three on investing. Thank you so much to Michael. Thank you so much to Gavin. Thank you so much to the Assisa Foundation. And thank you so much to you for joining us. Congratulations. Next week, it's all about entrepreneurship. The hustlers are going to be on the webinar. Happy Friday. Enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye, guys.